th thank our G for organizing this uh, symposium and for making oh, sure that we are almost within the bounds of time and how we're presenting each one of the sessions. <clears throat> so I'm pleased uh, to be in the second session, though I'm very humbled to be following my friend, uh, Dr. Hibbert Aouf, who did a marvelous job in summarizing and then expanding on each of the papers in her session. <clears throat> so I also have three papers from three different perspectives. <clears throat> I might add that all of them are within India, but it shows how diverse is India that we have. Uh, the first paper is a research scholar in political science from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. And everybody knows New Delhi, or at least they think they do, but they're gonna find out something different from the paper, which you'll hear. And then we have Muhammad Shafir, who uh, it comes from Tamil Nadu in the south of, of India. And we'll be talking about uh, distinct aspects of what goes on in um, the state of Kerala. And then we have lastly, Rosa Yumnan, who comes from a part of India that some people have a difficulty remembering, Meghalaya, but it's a very distinctive part of India that um, we will hear more about in her paper. And I will say some more about it in my comments later. But uh, without uh, taking more time from the papers themselves, because I want to save time for questions and answers at the end from the audience, and also from the fellow panelists who want to comment on each other. So without, I do want to say one thing about Barzakh. I can't resist saying one thing about Barzakh since uh, it has been so prominent in my discussions with Harjeev and is an ongoing topic. <clears throat> some of you may have noticed if you've seen pictures of my presentation that I started with just some squares behind me. And now I have behind me a painting, which is uh, by uh, a good friend of mine, Mustafa Ahmed, who's an Egyptian uh, painter, although he now lives in London. <clears throat> and this is called the Barzakh. <clears throat> so even if you've not read the Holy Quran and you don't understand what Barzakh is from the Quran, you can see it behind me. I'm pointing with my finger behind me. It's red and green. And it's got the Arabic writing, uh, which comes from Surah Rahman in the Quran. And even if you don't know the Quran or don't know this phrase in the Quran, you can see green and you can see red and you can see that they're touching each other, but neither one is invading the other space. <clears throat> so my simple comment, which is of course not so simple because it expands in many different directions for the topic of identity, violence and women, is you can have dyads, things that are as different as two words or two people or two structures of water like river and salt water, but you can also have them bounded without being intrusive. You can have dyads without having, uh, in every case, uh, contradictories or uh, dichotomies. So I, I am a firm believer that Barzakh is not just a statement of natural order or in the Holy Quran, but it is something which we can apply to life and we can apply it also to thinking about the topic. But first of all, men and women. And then I think the valuable thing, many valuable things that um, were said by Professor Hibba, but the fact that there is brutality or aggression, but not necessarily violence. So there can be a border or boundary between them. There doesn't have to be an overflow that every form of brutality and aggression automatically results in violence. So I think, uh, I hope that the no notion of Bazak logic lingers uh, in the presentations and beyond for today. And I thank Rajiv for taking it in another direction with his wonderful work on Kabir. So having said that, let me then turn to Namrata Hazarika and her paper, uh, which will be the first in my session. And it will be on the topic of uh, the body and the notion of violence as it's uh, communicated in some writings by Talal Asad and Pierre Bourdieu, among others. So. Uh, Namrata, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Bruce. I'll share my screen now. So the topic of uh, my topic is reconstructing the body through the language of violence. Linguistic expression is an important part of our everyday life in where every word is loaded with meaning and subtext and determine as well as reflect our position in the societal structure. The modern warfare has been able to demarcate a social political distinction between soldier and terrorist. There is a constant assessment in distinguishing 
between war and terrorism, where the word war has been appropriated by state as just bound within a legitimate set of norms and are considered within the purview of humanitarian law, while on the other hand, terrorism has been staunchly criticized because of its impact and its subject of target, that is, innocent civilian. The violence committed by the soldier is often measured within the uh, proportional limits of war rationality and righteousness, whereas the terrorist is guided by irrationality and anger. The degree of violence of the first might surpass that of the second. However, the sight of horror that a terrorist attack can flick is considered more brutal and inhuman. In this paper, my objective is to focus on the body that becomes subjected to violence as a constitutive of modern nation state through the vocabulary of obedience and control. Taking the works of Talal Asad on suicide bombing and Pierre Vortheo's language and symbolic power as my starting argument, I would try to understand violence and then distinguish its impact on the body when inflicted through modern warfare as opposed to militant groups. The body that is part of a political, social, and cultural field works under the influence of a symbolic domination. It is a meticulous work of art with violence as an instrumental tool. An anecdote of the kamikaze pilots can be observed as a distinct example of the use of body as a tool or weapon by the state. Kamikaze aircraft were part of Japanese special attack units in the Second World War and essentially pilot-guided explosive uh, missile purpose-built or converted from conventional aircraft. A uh, pilot would plan to crash their aircraft into enemy ships in what was called a body attack. High-ranking officers at that time have initially resisted this war strategy, but as the scenario deteriorated for their side, um, suicide attacks were formally employed. The point to be noted here is that the attack was not resisted initially due to its outcome of death of certain uh, number of soldiers, but due to its expensive nature, lack of power to cause further death of the enemy army and difficulty in evaluating the loss of enemies. The kamikaze pilot underwent strenuous training integrated with torturous corporeal punishment. They were hit hard and at times they, were, they could hardly uh, recognize themselves. This strenuous and extreme form of training is considered necessary to instill in soldiers the fighting spirit and determination. Pilots were put under observation all hours of the day and were given a manual to uh, on how to think, prepare and attack. Every act of theirs is regularized and monitored. The sense of modern warfare is embedded in the structure of the society and produces bodies that are meticulously controlled by the state. The intellectual and religious changes introduced during the period of Renaissance and Protestant Reformation compose a body of society that flagged the idea of liberation, containing within it a form of control. This increasing control, which is disciplinary in nature, focuses on the body and maximizing its utility. So the disciplinary power produces effects at the level of knowledge and desire. So while understanding the violence of modern warfare, it is equally important to understand that the entire societal structure functions to make it work. The soldiers are not only dependent on the morale of the civilians at home, but also dependent on the material culture produced by the same. Asid in his work capture the unnatural side of a suicide bombing attack where the body and its consequent parts are viewed as alien. What motivates the suicide bomber to pull the trigger? Are they in a state of aesthetic or in full consciousness? Do they actually believe that there is any justness in their act? In reality, there is no definite way to know what goes on those exact moments in the mind of a suicide bomber, and hence much of the narratives are based on assumptions and speculations. Some perceive it in systematic deprivation and humiliation suffered by the attacker due to his or her social and political conditioning, while others also associate such motivation with religious faith of the attacker due to his or her recorded proclamation before the operation. So here, Clifford Gertz's take on religion become very relevant where he stated that a religion is a system of symbol which acts to establish powerful, pervasive, long-lasting moods and motivations in men by formulating conception of a general order of existence and clothing these conceptions with an aura of factuality that the moods and motivations seems uniquely realistic. War strategies are made with an ambition to inflict maximum harm to the opposing party and it invites a calculation of the cost and benefit. Armies don't just merely kill its opponent, but targets have been strategically and systematically located to produce maximum output. And in this process, the creation of terror among the enemy is a crucial means of modern warfare. Constituents of cultural uh, factors like religion and education are used. Training is a significant part of producing such bodies and discipline resulting from such training increases the focus fo forces of the body that now maintains a clear relation between maximum utility in the economic sense and uh, facility in terms of political obedience. So hence the body of the public in general and the soldier in particular becomes a useful force that is subjected and obedient to perform tasks given and is under constant surveillance due to its productive nature. Liberal democracies expects and demands loyalties of the citizen to be prepared to kill and to die for the cause of the nation in return for a well-ordered society. 
The sacrificial aspect comprises a pivotal role in liberal democracies where the state discourses undertakes that the sacrifice of human life to ensure the immortality of the state and of the world order is crucial. So on suicide bombing, in suicide bombing, Asad seeks to question this very process of identification of legitimate targets. Ivan Strensky in his work proposed the religious concepts of gift and sacrifice in understanding suicide operation. Sacrifice is a profoundly social action, essentially involving a network of relationship, typically actualized in terms of system of social exchange. The na this nature of sacrifice is indeed one of the motivation for suicide bomber and their justification of giving their lives for a cause, that is their idea of a nation. It also carries a religious resonance and hence since sacrifice is the essence of religious subjectivity, violence is integral to it. This approach of looking at the act of suicide bomber finds the motivation in religious sources and establishes that the state's response in the form of violence is essential for ensuring security and stability. Here, the degree of violence by the soldier that is state sponsored is considered necessary and is in fact welcoming to a certain degree. But Stensky's approach kindles a particular normalization of state's violence in response to modern warfare. This normalization demands certain competence from individual to operate within the system and structure. Here, Bordeaux's conception of the idea of habitus is crucial and can give us an insight on the importance of context-specific historical tradition. The habitus provide individuals with a sense of how to act or respond in the course of their daily life and provide the individual with a medium and context to interact in. The field where these interactions take place is a constant site of struggle, where individuals seek to maintain and alter the form of distribution of capital that can be social, cultural, or symbolic in nature. Bordeaux develops a critique of traditional approaches to language and argues that linguistic expression must not be seen only as a medium of communication, but grounds as grounds of developing a relation between linguistic market and linguistic habitus. There is a tilt towards a model of linguistic imperialism, where a particular language assumes an all-encompassing dominance, uh, viewing it as a homogeneous and autonomous object. Linguistic utterances are always produced in particular contexts or market, and the properties of these markets endow linguistic product with a certain value, which is unevenly distributed in the society. One can easily locate it in the public sphere where men from upper class make it to the top riches with ease as compared to men from the working class, and women find it particularly difficult to make it to such domains. The modern liberal political space provides people with a sense of freedom and liberty, but it needs to be viewed with a critical lens. Linguistic work is a crucial medium to establish cultural hegemony and is much more than a sheer medium of communicating thoughts and festival feelings. It uh, carries with it a social historical conditioning that not only determine the different individual class group positioning, but also the power game surrounding the same. The process of normalization of this dominance has been carried out previously by religious dictates and now by soft targets, targets or strategies of education policies, cultural integration and historical legitimacy that itself is a creation of modern uh, imperialism and capitalism. The continuous process of training and disciplining method creates its own language of legitimate and illegitimate notion of violence and for the body that liberal democracies find its authenticity in the affirmation of the public and civilians. So coming to the conclusion, as mentioned in the introduction, there is a constant assessment in establishing the distinction between war and terrorism and through the same discourse of assessment, our body has been viewed as legitimate or illegitimate. The Western narrative secure advantages position as far as constructing such discourses are concerned and hence taking inspiration from Assad and Bordio, the paper advances to highlight the understanding of the body through the language of violence. Under the modern warfare, the component of training and disciplining of the body secure the utmost importance. The state invest significant amount of time in planning and executing such disciplining tools through its various institutions and structures. It is a process that is ever changing and ever evolving. The setup of educational institution can be seen as a primary example. Under both the circumstances involving a war and a terrorist attack, violence has been inflicted and lives are destroyed, but one is viewed as necessary, whereas the other is condemned as inhuman. The sight of horror that a terrorist attack lays out made the body involved in it as alien and not belonging to the normal. Now, what defines normal and legitimate is a question to be discussed and analyzed. The training that soldiers went through makes them accustomed to a certain frame of mind and body. They are disciplined and trained to perform acts of terror that are considered morally correct. The protection of civilian lives in national territories are some of the arguments put forth in making such acts legitimate and required. Symbolic power embedded in the social life of individual is often misrecognized, but worked as the most dominant medium to establish legitimacy. Linguistic utterances, commemorative stamps, statues are used and produced that has a definite value attached to it. This can be witnessed in the everyday lives of individual as we sit, talk, socialize, attend ceremonies, celebrate festivals, perform rituals, etc. So the body has always been in training. 
Hence, the purpose is here is to re-engage with the discourse of the body and understand the meaning and symbol through which it has been viewed. The normalization of dominance and control do not take into consideration the differences that exist across and within societies and hence undermine the individual aspiration of a free life. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for not only a very um, insightful talk and presentation, uh, but also keeping within the time. So since we have just a little bit of time, let me ask you a question which came up in my reading and rereading of your essay, which you were kind enough to send uh, for all of us ahead of time. Uh, you know, uh, just to pick up um, on this notion of um, training of the body, since uh, this topic is about women, or at least women and gender is a cu crucial issue of this entire um, gathering, I wonder if you could elaborate because there are no references to women uh, in, in your actual presentation. And in terms of thinking about how this theoretical framework, which you sh shape very nimbly, how it affects women, their identity, the violence perpetrated on them or by them. I wonder if you could go back to something in your written presentation. I don't think it came out in the, in the short, shorter version here. But when you talk about uh, Ivan Strensky, and his normalization of state violence in response to modern warfare, you note, you note that Islam is not comprised the same meaning of sacrifice as Christianity, which is the basis for Strensky's argument. So I think that's a very valuable insight and a very valuable critique of uh, Ivan Strensky and his approach. But I would ask you then, how would you think of the Islamic justification for female suicide bombing, which has been something that has been taken into account in many of the treatments of violence in Islam? Yes, uh, when I was writing this paper, I was thinking more in terms of the body, like uh, I, was I was not actually uh, differentiating between a man and a woman, but as I was reading and going through Bordeaux's work, it, it depends upon uh, the contextualization or in which context the women are situated. For example, right now, if we can see, then um, it, it becomes very difficult for the women to make uh, themselves heard or listen. And this depends upon the entire structure and how the society is built. You know, the, like, the previous session when this, uh, I, I think one of the participants when asked the question that it is about the state and uh, you know, if, uh, if the state has failed to uh, provide any protection to the women, then it depends upon, then there should be a certain restriction that needs to be placed. And the, the response was, uh, we need to change ourselves at first. So the conditioning and the habitus that we live in uh, it becomes very important. So when Bordeaux makes a differentiation between subjective and objective observation, so this, we need to make a balance between the subjective and the objective uh, notion and comes out with a more, uh, uh, you know, widening and a broader scope of actually observing what is happening in our surrounding and then situating with ourselves and then make, uh, try to engage in a conversation where it becomes a safe space for the women. And as far as Ivan Strensky's uh, argument goes, like sacrifice is very different from Islam or, and the difference, the different distinction he draws between in Christianity and Islam is uh, if we uh, look into the script, uh, like into the text, like uh, there's a certain degree of importance that is associated with the body in as far as the Christianity is concerned. Like we, uh, the Cartesian philosophy, the distinction between the mind and the body. And uh, there goes, I think uh, Islam and Islam, the idea of sacrifice is more related to like, uh, to your faith, you know, uh, that we should not be, uh, we should not separate ourselves to what we believe in or Muhammad. So there goes a certain uh, level of uh, separation between the body and our faith. So I think the this in this sense, uh, there's a difference between uh, Islam and Christianity. I hope I am able to answer a, a bit of it. Like, I still am looking forward to like uh, creating a distinction between uh, the men and the female. But as far as I as far as I was concerned, when I was writing this paper, I was looking into the body as a uh, concrete and an absolute and an abstract form, rather than creating differences in its uh, on the basis of gender. Yeah, I appreciate you're taking the abstract form. I just wanted to ground it in some of the conversations we've had so far. I see somebody's hand up, at Dr. Mubasha. Yes, uh, thank you for um, providing me an opportunity to comment on this. Uh, I've been, uh, I belong to Pakistan and uh, I am in the country which has faced most suicide bombing attacks other than the whole world. 
so <clears throat> i've i've been uh, uh, very close to uh, the places where they have been trained to suicide bomb but again firstly coming to the argument that what are islam's uh, point of view of sacrifice islam has given us this body as amana and uh, we need to so amana for those who don't know what amana means trust as a trust from the god exactly and and you know uh, uh, jihad or any other perspective does not want your body to be uh, in the first place it, to be given up it is the last resort and again when allowed by the state so your body is basically amana by the allah subhanahu wa taala and uh, regarding suicide bombing and relating it to bazakh you know uh, here in the camps where uh, the kids were used to be trained for suicide bombing uh, they were placed in a in a small house where there were drawings on the walls portraying uh, hoors and uh, rivers and they were given um uh, a perspective that this is jannah and you would be going straight to jannah when you would get blasted and um, they, they they were sexually aroused they were aroused by uh, religious uh, sc- uh, scripts as well but mostly they were sexually aroused and their their, their persuasion for suicide bombing was for sexual uh, desires and again it was always it was always focused towards the other gender the female gender and <clears throat> the female gender has been you can say uh, portrayed to be very suppressed in islamic perspective and it has been like uh, <clears throat> portrayed to be utilized as a commodity or just for a sexual pleasure but it is not what the real islamic teachings are in if, if you see in the wars during the holy prophet's time uh, our females have been working in the front line along with the soldiers they have been providing medical aid and so on and they, they they have been actually involved in it and they they have been they were not given the right for property ownership after the their uh, forefathers died but again in islam they gave the right to them so thank gender, you dr mubash wrap you. up because we have to go on please wrap up just uh, just uh, finishing it up like uh, so uh, the berserk concept relating it to the suicide bombing what this study was about like the kids are treated to be like they they would they are in berserk and they would be going to berserk and and that berserk would be very nice for them and that is one of the reasons they were pushed towards suicide bombing thank you very much thank you very much and, and thank you very much namada for this uh, very uh, provocative and, and helpful talk and now i think i need to go to the second paper and uh, mohammed shafir or mohammed are you online here yes yes sir thank you uh, your the floor is now yours yes thank you sir Okay, uh, the topic of my paper is uh, new aspects of uh, dowry and Malabar Muslim women. Uh, actually, um, I have to tell something about Malabar. Actually, Malabar is a place um, in Kerala in the colonial time because Kerala was not uh, <clears throat> a single state at that time. There are the <clears throat> there were three country states called the Cochin, Travancore, and Malabar. after the formation of the state uh, about six districts consist uh, the place called dowry i have three aspects that is the i want to focus on uh, three uh, stages of dowry that is from the colonial times uh, and after colonization and Uh, the third stage is after uh, the migration to gulf countries that is in the 1980s so in the colonial times uh, the malabar region there were two types of families so that is one who supported uh, the british rule and one who opposed the british 
majority of the Muslims were against the British rule. And those who opposed the British rule uh, were suppressed or demolished by the British because there was a ferocious resistance from the Malabar people, especially from the Muslims. So those who supported uh, the Britishers became the landlords and uh, they uh, have the properties of the other land and uh, those marriages. But uh, all the other uh, people who were against the British, they were not thinking about all these uh, relationships or something because they were focusing on, against, uh, focusing on the fight against the British. So at the time, uh, the families, the marriages were um, conducted by the elders. The bride or groom had little uh, part in the relationship. The elders called carnivores. They will be visiting the bride and they will be talking with their family. And the <coughs> carnivores from the groom's family will be visiting the bride's house and they will be having an agreement. Uh, the thing is that the bride and the groom will be seeing together or will be together or will be seeing for the first time only in the first night only. That's the case. So uh, the freedom of the bride and groom was at stake. And uh, they had a little part or little sh uh, share in the process of marriage. So the Karanavas were handling all this. And they were deciding uh, uh, the matters about dowry. At that time, dowry was uh, in Malabar area, dowry was <clears throat> uh, in the form of um, gold. And there were specific ornaments, that is golden belt, and uh, some chains with specific names that was fixed by the carnivores. And uh, the marriages will be fixed based on the holding of the land. And uh, the carnivores will be uh, focusing on uh, the straw, uh, that is the straw stacked and uh, the number of cattle uh, in the family or in the house, because it means that they have uh, land and there won't be any poverty <laughs> at that time because of there'll be a uh, stock of grains all the time. So that determined uh, the relationship, marital relationship. And at that time, the Karanavas were the uh, prime uh, decision makers in the matters of marriage and dowry. And nobody protested against this system of dowry because nobody raised their voice against the decisions of the Karanavas because uh, the Karanavas of the family and the society that is called a Palli Karanavas. That's the uh, leaders of the mosque who controlled the mosque. Their decisions were uh, never uh, revoked or uh, <clears throat> questioned. And uh, the marriages were held in that manner. And after the liberation of the country, uh, there was a slight change because the family uh, who were demolished uh, by the British or were suppressed or oppressed by the British began to re regain their identity and they began to work their own and they were finding their way to mitigate poverty and hardships from their life. <clears throat> so at that time, um, normally uh, the carnivores were deciding all the matters of ma uh, marriage and dowry, but uh, gradually the groom began to have a share in all these discussions. After the 1947 and in 1950s, they have some share in all these discussions. And um, uh, the aspect changed because uh, the dowry included both gold and money. So uh, the groom's family demanded money in advance because they have to meet the expenses of the marriage because the marriages will be a luxurious uh, uh, ceremony in Malabar. Today also, it's like that. We'll be spending lakhs and crores for that. So uh, that happened and the brides, uh, no, sorry, the groom's family began to demand uh, money advance. But the condition changed slightly in the 1980s because of the Gulf migration. In order to uh, wipe out the poverty and hardships from the society, the young people from Malabar began to migrate to Gulf countries because of the oil boom. And money began to flow into these areas as remittances. This changed the aspect of dowry again. It increased the amount of dowry because uh, uh, with that, the financial background was stabilized in the Malabar region. And uh, uh, the um, pivotal uh, factor was the presence of an individual 
from a family in the gulf countries if there is any one uh, from the bright family in the gulf countries the dowry the amount of dowry was raised because everybody thought that they are uh, amassing money from there because they are actually they are uh, uh, working hard in this gulf countries in the adverse conditions so uh, that raised the amount of money in the 1980s it was uh, 1 lakh rupees and 20 to 30 pounds pound means one uh, one pound is 8 grams you know but uh, and the groom began to groom directly began to demand money for the expenses of the marriage so and the groom began to decide whom i have to marry the current levels began to diminish from the marriage the context of marriage and their role was limited and the men or the groom began to have a um, decisive role in their own marriage and they decided the uh, amount of dowry they have to expect because of their it depends depends on their uh, financial background and uh, what they have to plan after the marriage so it was like 1 lakh or 2 lakh in the 1980s and uh, at that time but this condition changed after the 2000s because the girl children from malabar region began to educate themselves because of the financial background from the uh, because uh, as a result of the gulf migration and in after the 2000 uh, they began to decide the pivotal uh, have a, their role in the deciding their marriage they uh, raised their voice against uh, the decisions of the family which was which compelled them to agree to the marriage so mohammed so, you have about less than 5 minutes less than 5 minutes okay. left okay that's enough that's enough and um, but the aspects of the uh, dowry changed but nobody was against the dowry everybody will tell that uh, dowry must be eradicated it must be wiped about uh, wiped away from the society but when it comes to the personal personal life no girl or no uh, men is ready to keep away gold from their marriages after the 2000s gradually the money have began to diminish from this scene and uh, the gold was only constant because the uh, amount of uh, price of gold began to rise and uh, the attitude of malabar muslim women towards dowry is that uh, they want they began to demand dowry from their fathers from their family and it becomes it became a uh, symbol of reputation and recognition the girl will be demanding i want this much of dowry and they will be comparing with their siblings with their elder or younger sisters you give this much of gold for them and why you are giving this much and this comparison is happening they will be against dowry but they want gold ornaments or property for their marriage this thing that it will make their life in the groom's family safe and secure and the next condition is that when there is a partition of the ancestral property of the father or mother they will be demanding you give this much of gold for me and you give this much for uh, your uh, elder uh, daughter so this is this pawn uh, less for me so i want more property so the aspects of dowry is changing and the attitude towards uh, the uh, malabar muslim women is also changing they are against dowry in the academic life but in their practical personal life uh, they accept dowry not explicitly but implicitly so i i would wind up the, with this i think Uh, that's all thank you for the occasion thank you for listening <clears throat> thank you sir thank you bros so you you're welcome mohammed and i i read your paper with great interest and i was glad to see that um we could push push you in put you in the middle between two very strong women uh nanota who's already talked and rosie who's going to be talking after you both of whom are giving very uh, graphic instances of violence uh in numerous case not so much against women but against a different uh order of uh systemic violence and you're actually giving a case study of systemic violence although you don't label it as such and i would think if i had to make just a mild critique of your paper it's very long on description and the stories and the different segments of the history of the malabar muslim women and the matter of dowry is very interesting but what i miss is some kind of analytical insight about land and production i'm not a marxist but maybe i'm a barbarian 
everything that happens in society has to have at least an economic or social component. And for instance, one of the things that struck me in your paper, which I outlined when I was thinking about the comments, is you write about a system which caused the death of young girls in the groom's houses, but we never see the faces of the young girls in the groom's houses. There's a sense in which not only the system deprives them, but actually may cause their deaths. But you have this really wonderful sentence, which I would love to see expanded, the system which caused the death of young girls in the groom's houses and took the generation to the corners of their houses with soot, dust, and dirt. This, this is all the subject. And then you say this took new manifestation despite the education, employment, and global exposure of Malabar Muslim women. So this is a very keenly felt analytical insight, but there are no examples given. And it's not related to the structure of economy, which has produced, first of all, the idea that the upper classes have to have gold ornaments. And then with the exposure to the Gulf, the more the provision of upper classes to have it, but middle and lower classes not to have it. So at the end of it, I wanted to see more, less description, more analysis. And it was what I especially missed because you have this wonderful bibliography that includes a book by Gita Adavamudan called Disappearing Daughters, The Tragedy of Female Feticide. One of the things that has been most noted about um, the, the uh, West Coast of India, especially Kerala and Malabar, has been the, 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 the number of women who have been killed as, as babies, which is against Muslim law and Muslim practice and the scripture of the Quran itself, the strictures of the Quran itself. So I wondered if you could just say something briefly in the few times that we have before, a few minutes before we have to go on to the next uh, discussion. What about the disappearing daughters and the tragedy of female feticide in Malabar? Okay, I, I should admit that uh, I was uh, not well prepared for uh, writing this uh, paper because um, <clears throat> I wrote the paper when I was having some uh, post-COVID vaccination uh, reactions. Still, I'm not free from that. I should admit that uh, it was not well prepared and well analyzed. I should admit that. And uh, the rate uh, <clears throat> regarding the female feticide in Malabar, the female feticide in Malabar is much less compared to the other regions of Kerala and India. That's the case because uh, the main reason for uh, female feticide is the economical uh, <clears throat> condition of the family. In Malabar, uh, the economic conditions is well uh, good after uh, this uh, Gulf migration because uh, before the 1980s, uh, the ratio of girl education was much less because of this um, Gulf migration and, and the flow of remittance from Gulf countries. The uh, migrants realized the value of education and they began to think about the girls' education. And the, in, in, nowadays, the girls are educating much and the, the family is giving much importance to girl education. So uh, after the Gulf migration, uh, the female feticide rate is much less compared to other regions of Kerala and other regions of the other states of the country. And um, uh, you were- So if, uh, I can just, uh, if I can just add, ask you, if, if the female infanticide is not as great as elsewhere, why is it then you come to the end of this long uh, historical um, overview of what the structures are and the different phases of Malabar Muslim women and dowry, but at the end of it, you say, despite the fact that these generations have all been educated, the system of dowry still perceived and it can't go away until the new generation rejects it. But how is it possible when systemic violence is so deeply rooted for the next generation to resist or, or go against it? The violence regarding dowry is uh, <clears throat> one, uh, formally and it was like, um, uh, there would be an agreement in between the families that this amount of money and gold must be given. When the bride's family fails to give that, that uh, is the main reason for uh, domestic violence. And uh, there is one more reason. If there are two boys in a family, and if the first, the elder boy is getting this much of dowry, and uh, the younger uh, bride's uh, amount of dowry will be compared with the elders. And if the, uh, because of this comparison, the, the girl with um, less dowry will be ill-treated. That leads to domestic violence. And nowadays, the main reason for domestic violence is based on dowry is that 
we are not uh, the malabar people families are not demanding dowry it's all based on expectations and there will be some there will be some words in, in the discussions that uh, you are a reputed family and we know that we will you will meet our expectations so when these expectations are broken Uh, because this expectation is based on the family name uh, economic the expected uh, in the illusionary uh, economic uh, uh, status of the family when the groom's family uh, fails to meet the expectation or if they are not getting the amount of gold they expected that leads to domestic violence and uh, when the bride's the groom's family is facing some financial problems then the amount of dowry will again came to the limelight and uh, the the man will be demanding more dowry from the bride's family well thank you for for this elaboration and uh i wish we had long for the discussion and i hope when you recover from covid no not even... covid not covid not uh, covid not because of covid covid vaccination reactions from, the, from the the when you, when you when you when you continue yeah. to be a covid free person that you can <laughs> come back to this seven again and expand it so thank you very much thank you, thank you. Now, now we must go on oh. to the final paper by rosie so even though we've had two very good presentations by research scholars this is the first time now with rosie umran that we're having a professor and i want to just say that rosie umran is not only a professor uh in uh in Meghalaya but she comes from a state which has a matrilineal system and for those of you who don't know that much about India it's very unusual to have a matrilineal system that pervades a state where English is also the dominant language and for those of you who don't know it Meghalaya is also very very famous because as of 3 years ago in 2018 the world geologists decided that the new age the age in which all of us live is called the Meghalayan age So even though we're talking about feminism and narrative in, in 17th century Manipur fiction is pleasant is really important to note that as we progress into the 21st century that according to geologists of course that they're not as important as political scientists or uh, philosophers or uh, sociologists but they still have a role to play in how society thinks of itself so according to geologists Meghalaya is not only an important part of India but the Meghalayan age defines all of us since 4200 years ago so on the basis of that long range history of meghalaya i'm pleased to introduce rosa yumran and ask her to give her paper can you can you un, unmute rosie yeah i have unmuted sir thank you respected sir can you hear me sir yes we can hear you thank you rosie yes thank you respected chair for giving me this opportunity to present my paper here in this platform uh i have uh, very uh, you know my network uh, is very bad here erratic here i have been trying to share my i will not be able to share my slides sir and even my video i'll be mute uh, you know putting off my video i'll try to read my paper as fast as i can sir my network is very bad here Oh, I'll give you a full 15 minutes. Go ahead. I'll give you 15 yes. minutes given you given you I'm your trying to go in from challenge. very devices. <laughs> yeah, thank you sir. Please go ahead. Yes, yes. Mm. Well, uh good evening everybody. Uh uh the title of my paper is Reflection uh, uh Reflection of Feminism. in the myth narrative of pantoibi kongul uh well uh feminism uh, is defined as a belief of equality of sexes in terms of economic social and political affairs though originated in the west feminism is evidently present in every corner of the world as a literary movement feminism seeks to rebel against the patriarchal society where the term masculine is associated with superiority domination action and strength Conversely, feminine or the other is associated with inferiority, passivity, weakness, and obedience. Uh, feminist writers highlight the predicament of women in a patriarchal society and how, and look at how a sense of self-identity, rebellion, and self-assertion will liberate women from the deeply rooted patriarchal societal constraints. Various institutions and organizations present feminine represent feminism. 
to cater to uh, activities pertaining to women's rights and interests. Nahal defined feminism as a form of existence where the woman gets rid of the dependent syndrome. A dependent syndrome exists whether in the form of the father, the husband, the community, the religious group, or the ethnic uh, group. Nahal emphasizes that his idea of feminism materializes when women are completely free of the dependent syndrome and start leading a normal life. And uh, conversely, Bubar posits, I quote, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman, unquote. She further asserts that psychological, biological, or economic fate does not establish the presence of human female in society. However, civilization produces this human female, which is somewhere in the transitional phase between male and unex, described as feminine. So it is apparent that feminism is a common goal to describe a political, social, cultural, or economic equality of sexes. And uh, a feminist movement strongly advocate protesting against male domination, uh, headed by, you know, influenced, greatly influenced by philosophers and thinkers, uh, you know, like uh, Wilson Graf, Showalter, Vivor, Millet, uh, Butler, and so on. So coming to my text, which I'm referring to, Panthoibi Kongul is a myth narrative of Manipur. Uh, Manipur is a state in the northeastern part of uh, India. It's... Uh, uh, Meghalaya is uh, Meg uh, the northeastern part of India consists of Meghalaya, Manipur, and uh, uh, six other states as well. So this text details the rebel of a legendary woman, Pantoibi, and against the patriarchal society of the early Manipuri society. Now coming coming to the term patriarchy, uh, an important phase in modern feminism could be seen when. Kate Millett used the term patriarchy, uh, rule of the father in sexual politics, to describe the course of women's oppression. Earlier, modern feminist writers like Millett, Greer, and Elman had written about expressing women's political awareness about their oppressions by men. Patriarchy is a cardinal concept of the radical second wave feminist who defines it as, I quote, a system of social structures and practices in which men dominate, oppress, and exploit women, uh, while we caught it in Wilson. So uh, uh, Wilson observes that the development of many of the important feminist ideas and programs in the global platform is a result of the use of this concept of patriarchy. The politics of the sexual dominance, as Millet posits, is that an objective uh, assessment of a sexual relationship system should adhere to the situation between the sexes at present and all through history as a case of Max Weber phenomenon, which is defined as Hashaf, a dominance and subordinance relationship. The social order which believes in the birthright idea that males rule females often goes unexamined. This idea is prominent as a form of, I quote Millet here, interior colonization, unquote. So and endures rigidly more than any form of class stratification. Though it may be muted, sexual dominance is prevalent in any form of culture and forms the basis of concept of power. So the sexual dominance Millet believes is because, I quote, our society, like all other historical civilizations, is a patriarchy, unquote. So the reason is that given, being given is that the industry, military, universities, science, finance, uh, and every aspect of power within the realms of society is entirely in the hands of males. This is what uh, Millet believes. Therefore, so, Rosie, it is evident. We have about yes. five more minutes. Yes. Oh, yes, yes sir. So, uh, so I'm coming to the objective of my paper. Uh, it has uh, so. The paper examines the feminist perspective of how women has been represented in Panthoipi Kongkul in the context of the early patriarchal Manipuri society and to uh, look at how uh, the, uh, the feminist reading of Panthoipi Kongkul will assist in striving to achieve quality. So uh, Panthoipi Kongkul is the literary text of the early 17th century written anonymously in an ancient script, Maite Mayek, and uh, it is rendered into modern Manipuri and translated to English. It describes... Uh, <clears throat> The text, uh, okay, uh, Panthoibi Kongkul is a traditional myth narrative chronicling the early culture and religious traditions of Manipur. Panthoibi and Nongpongintha are worshipped as deities in many Manipuri households. Uh, as Lystrom observes, Panthoibi and Nongpongintha are worshipped together as Nongpong Panthoibi 
and further Mantobi is believed to be the fire god's daughter. Okay, then the text begins by describing the beautiful and enthralling virtues, virtues of Mantobi. Uh, many suitors came for her hand, but she was never impressed by any of them. But her father and brothers convinced her, not convinced actually, forced her into marrying a prince uh, of the Kaaba dynasty. So she was married off. The marriage was a complete fail failure. The society demands her to be chained to her husband's house, but she was adamant. Uh, she was not, though she was discontented initially due to social obligations. Uh, she was trying, she tried to uh, adhere to the parents-in-law and the, her, her husband's um, uh, no, way of life, she became muted owing to the societal demands. Uh, but as she was a feisty woman, she soon came out of her innovations and she started uh, moving around, wandering in the meadows. And uh, one fine day, on such an escapade, she met the handsome Nongpok Ninko, who is the lord of uh, a place again there, of a place called uh, Langmai Hills. So they fell in love and uh, finally they, uh, you know, and despite social uh, restrictions, the strict so patriarchal society did not allow uh, the, as a human being, uh, this uh, Pantoibi has the right to love or not to love somebody. But then, though she was unhappy, she was not allowed to divorce her husband. Instead, she has to endure the unhappy marriage. Her father-in-law even pretended to be dead to win her sympathy. So the quick-witted Pantoibi instead took this opportunity of being tricked and tortured and then uh, thus challenging and resisting the age-old barrier of social custom, she finally a paramour. So then the Kabas, uh, they came in search of her, but then they couldn't find her. And uh, the lovers, uh, they finally, they went to the Langmai Hills and everyone celebrated there in the land of uh, love. They all, uh, you know, the merriment of the celebrations of the union of Pantoibi and Nongpongintho can be seen even today in the Laiharaba Festival of Manipur. Laiharaba is the social and religious festival of Manipur. So even though they... I think we lost. Uh, we lost you. <laughs> we lost her. So yes, I mean there is there is some problem in in Meghalaya. Yes. Now, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. yeah, yeah you can finish now in two minutes. I'll just, I'll just conclude. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, so. The legendary Pantoipi, the woman is represented as a fearless, courageous, witty uh, woman, and she challenged the patriarchal societal constraints, which restrict her to be submissive to the male members in the society. Millet's contention that sexual dominance is due to patriarchy prevails in the early history of Manipur, and traces of it can be found even today. The imbalanced society, social orders of males and females has been con contested by Pantoipi in a form of rebellion against the existing social const construct of inequality between the two sexes. Sexual uh, dominance was clearly visible in the myth narrative due to the societal patriarchal constraints. Pantoibi's doting father and brothers convinced her into, not convinced, forced her into marrying someone without actually giving her chance to know the prince. So uh, the operation of the woman, the operation of the woman in the form of restrictions and customs, I think. Uh, I think uh, you need to close one. Uh, you have logged in with the two the yes, IDs. Yes, so I have need... logged in. I'll yeah. just log in. Log in. Yeah. Then, so, uh, the operation of the woman in the form of restrictions and customs, which is induced by the patriarchal or oriental, uh, oriented society of the time, is challenged by the brave Pantoibi. She uh, asserted to be herself. She rebelled against the social traditions for what she felt was right for a woman. Pantoibi becomes the powerful entity who successfully achieved. <clears throat> the feminist goal of achieving equality of the two sexes by a way of revolting against the social norms instituted by the patriarchal world. So to conclude, the myth narrative thus brings forth the bravery, bravery of a young woman who liberates herself from the customs and traditions of a patriarchal society. The plight of Pantoibi is tested in the narrative and she gracefully finds a way to assert her self-identity. The legendary Pantoibi embodies the fiery woman who challenges the social norms to stand for what is right and to cleanse the evil of inequality in the society. Uh, so Pantoibi does represents every woman and their voice in the society. And uh, does essay the feminist goal of achieving equality of sex by challenging additional conditioning of uh, patriarchy. Thank, well, thank you all you. for your...
patients uh, listening and uh, so sorry for this network problem. <laughs> no, uh, thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you for persisting and for giving us a clear message despite the, uh, the, the, the murkiness of the internet service that prevented you from giving it fully and from us seeing you. So I want to say uh, just a couple things about your paper. One is I really commend you for doing something which I wish all presenters would do. You state up front what is the objective of your paper. You also state the methodology, and then you define feminism itself in very broad strokes. And so but by the time someone has read the first couple pages of your paper, they know uh, why you picked the topic, what your approach to it is, and what is your goal. So I think that's a very admirable way of doing it. And um, my, my, my major problem with what you'd say is not your analysis and not the description of Penta B. Coco, but in the end, you say she succeeds as a woman, but she succeeds as a woman by, by escaping her human condition and becoming a goddess. To quote you, she rebelled against these social traditions. Uh, she becomes a powerful entity who achieved the feminist goal of equality of sexes by way of revolting against the social norms. She finally became a divine goddess. So as admirable as this story may be, and the festival celebrating her uh, annually, is it realistic to conclude that Penelope thus represents every woman and their voice in society when very few have the chance to become goddesses? Uh, uh, sir, yes. Uh, this is a myth narrative. Uh, so it's a belief that uh, Panthabi very bravely, in those times, it is a 17th century narrative. And so in those times, the conditions of uh, females, women in particular, females, uh, you know, we, we have this um, uh, no great uh, problem there. Uh, the women were muted. They were they do they don't have any voice. It's not like the twenty first century today. So, uh, you know, in those times, how uh, Antoibi, uh came out of her inhibitions, uh, even though she was forced into a you know in, into a marriage, uh, which she did not uh, want, um, but then she was forced into um, uh, into the marriage by her you know by her brother by her brothers and the, uh, the father and her father. So, uh, because even then, even in those in those times, how she uh, came out, how she came out, how she uh, contested the societal norms. So that uh, prompted me to work on to look into this um, perspective, sir. Yeah, no, I I really, as I say, admire the way you uh, offered your paper and the structure of it, and um, my only. Uh, enduring question is beyond the description, which is very rich and suggestive, how does one apply this in terms of thinking about women in um, Manipur society today? It's, it's great as a myth. Is it also have practical lessons for how women are able to approach their situation as, as sisters, as mothers, as brides, as citizens? Mm. Mm. In other words, does it remain a myth or is it also an activating principle? Uh, uh, pardon me, sir. I am not able to get you. Uh, I cannot no, so I my question, hear you. My question to you was not about the content and the greater uh, scope of your paper, but it's simply about its application to everyday society. So for instance, the previous paper from Muhammad, we heard a lot about dowry and the strictures that it puts on people and the way in which it can be both considered as a go as as as, a, as an oppressive structure, but also something that's an enduring structure for people in society. So, the pushback against the myth of Panapi Konko would be: what are the what are the ways in which women in everyday society escape the human condition or better the human condition through identifying with Panapi Koko? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, now, the present society, uh, women in Manipur um, are empowered sir mm. we are empowered and then uh, the people even in uh, in in a place we have a market called uh, ima market especially run by females and uh, uh, so because of this uh, like pantopi as the uh, as an example 
females of Manipur are empowered and uh, uh, they, they have a voice, they have a voice in the society and uh, yes, women uh, in general in Manipur are doing very well, sir. Mm. Well, thank you. I, I think in the interest of time, I will say that I'm really glad mm. that we had these three papers and that they clustered as they did starting out with something that was deeply theoretical and looking at the whole issue of the body and then somebody is looking at dowry as a way of manipulating the body in, in, in uh, Kerala uh, and, and Malabar, and then ending up in Northeast India in what's now the Magalayan age for all of us, thinking about women who are bettering their, their society because of attention to a piece of literature, which most of us, I have to include myself, had never heard of before your paper. So I feel as if you've not only instructed us, but also educated us, and thank you for that paper. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Now let me turn it back over to you, Rajiv, because it's ex it's ex been ex almost exactly an hour. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, if you, if anyone would like to raise questions, uh, I would request to have a brief question, one or two, maybe, or or maybe we we have already exceeded uh, our time, uh, so uh, uh, we will wind up, wind up here. So if you have uh, any question, please raise your hand and or directly unmute yourself and. Uh, uh, or you have a comment you can make. So thank you very much uh, for the for this uh, today's uh, session and the whole uh, entire long session uh, from the inauguration to the the second uh, session of the symposium. Uh, so we will be uh, winding up uh, today's uh, sessions and uh, uh, we'll see you. Uh, tomorrow again um, uh, as uh, scheduled time. So please uh, do follow and uh, and please be on time uh, uh, tomorrow so we can start the symposium on uh, very time because uh, people are from the various part of uh, country and uh, we, we we need to um, uh, think about their uh, uh, their timing as well. So thank you very much, Professor Bruce. Uh, uh, Lawrence and and uh, and uh, all the par uh, presenters, uh, uh, Professor Kalpna and Professor Roji, and uh, Muhammad and Narmata. Uh, thank you very much, and all the audience uh, for uh, um, keeping your, uh, yourselves tuned with the symposium. Uh, see you again. Salam alaikum, namaste, khuda hafiz. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Sadi. Swasti and Matisa.